This is Ogradowski of WeAreChange.org here in Lisbon, Portugal at the Infinite Man Conference. A conference filled with many interesting speakers, but the overall trend here is people who were dealt a crappy situation and turned that crap into fertilizer and turned it into something awesome and amazing. And one of the people who did that is definitely Peter Sage. And that's why we are going to be talking about mental health, suicide, and a lot of other important issues that of course the mainstream does not want you to know. Peter, I, I just heard your speech and I heard you talk you were sent uh, to you were sentenced to 12 months in jail when you were having a corporate dispute in civil court you're not a criminal you weren't charged as a criminal but you were sent to one of the toughest prisons in all of Europe and the story is just fascinating can you just tell us a little bit of your backstory and the incredible situation that was thrown your way Yes, yeah, certainly. I, uh, I, as you said, didn't see it coming. You know, I was involved in a, a corporate, you know, civil action that I thought was really just bully boy tactics from some you know, company that had a lot more money than me. And uh, I kicked back against that. They they pulled out of the bag a, a contempt of court application, which I just thought was a chess move. You know, in in litigation, civil litigation, it's it's all a chess move. That's pretty much what it is. And so I thought it would be laughed out of court in five minutes. And little did I know that you know, court is not about you know what's right, what's wrong, what's true what isn't that's you know, that, that, that got blown out of the water that if you think that you're in Disneyland no it's uh, who can twist or distort context in order to support preconceived agendas and who can essentially hire the best storytellers mm -hmm. and that's usually who has the most money yeah. so yeah I found myself on the wrong end of a contempt of court application that I thought would just be laughed out of court in five minutes I got sentenced to 12 months which as a civil prisoner yeah you know, I only serve half so I actually ended up doing six months inside and I lost my business I, I lost you know, you know, reputation at the time because nobody knew what was going on I didn't have a contingency and you know, just before I was going in my fiance turned around to me and she said oh my god what, what, what happens if you actually go away and I'm like well honey I'm, I'm very fortunate you know my work has been seen by millions of people around the world you know on YouTube and, and what have you and, and seminars that I've done and uh, if those people get benefit that's great but maybe there's a part of society that don't actively seek out personal growth or are in a place where they don't get access to it like prison and certainly a prison like Pentonville you know so maybe life wants to send me in there to be able to bring a light to people that don't normally have it and if that's the case then honey let me go let me go do it and that was the energy that I went in with. I, I didn't see myself as a criminal for one second, or I wasn't a criminal, I didn't see myself as a prisoner, not for a, not for a heartbeat. I saw myself as a secret agent of change. And that's how I went in, and that was my mission. I went to go and try to bring a light into a dark place. Now, I didn't realize how dark it was, to be honest with you. Yeah, And it's also what I call a graduation event. You know, the river of life twists and turns, we know that. But how do you deal with the bends in the river? Uh, how do you deal with it? Do you, do you bitch and complain because it isn't flowing the way you want? Well, life never does. There's no straight lines in nature. You see a straight line, it's man-made. So, you know, if all of a sudden you're heading south and your goal's south and everything's looking rosy, but the river suddenly throws you a left turn, a curveball, what do you do with that? How, how, do, you, how do you cope? Because it's, it's adversity that allows us to define who we are. And that's one thing I was trying to teach the prisoners. You know, your circumstances never define you, my friends. Yeah, it only gives you an opportunity to be able to define, define yourself. Yeah. And you get to decide where you go, and you definitely learn the lesson of the courts when you go up against a mega corporation like you did. Mm -hmm. And the rules are definitely not fair at all. But can you just tell us about some of the experiences you had and the people you were able to help uh, while in jail and the progress you made and the things you learned? That's a big question, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no, absolutely. I mean, I. Yeah, I came from a place, I say, of wanting to serve. You know, I, I was a secret agent of change, and I was going to try to make a difference. And when I saw, as you said, you know, how you know, completely fundamentally flawed the system is, and how it serves you know, virtually no resources to people that are there as deer in the headlights. You know, you, you will conform if you don't have mental resources. Now, luckily, you know, I spent 30 years in personal growth. You know, I spent 15 years working alongside Tony Robbins as one of his senior trainers. You know, I've, you know, I, I have luckily a tool set to be able to fall on there, but most people don't so I thought what can I do to be able to help now the first thing really is to understand that the primary challenge that many people have especially when it comes to being depressed yeah depression is essentially that you know the outer world does not fit the pictures of what I think it should look like according to my inner world and therefore that mismatch and that unmet expectations and the rules I have around it and how it makes me feel is usually the root cause of depression now in all fairness 
you know, the common denominator with people that are depressed is that they are, unfortunately to say it, they're too focused on themselves, right? Because, you know, that's, that's really egocentric, but it's, you know, they don't have a choice. They don't have a way to be able to look at or break out of that because they feel they're still trying to wrestle with you know, reality to make it fit their pictures. And if they feel powerless about that and they don't feel they've got a way out, then they flunk. So, you know, one of the fastest ways to get out of depression is to be able to take the focus off yourself and what you can contribute. The challenge is if you're depressed, you don't think you've got anything to contribute because you feel worthless because you know, life doesn't fit, fit your pictures. So one of the first things that I, I do with the prisoners I was working with is I get them to the state of acceptance. Now, acceptance of what is, is a big deal. Yeah, it's a powerful yeah, uh, level of consciousness. Why? Because what most people are unhappy about is the level of resistance that they have to what is. Yeah, they can't change it, and therefore they complain, or they feel disempowered, or they feel upset, or what have you. But if you've just spilt the milk on your brand new carpet, for example, then yeah, you may be upset and bitch about it, and that may become your story. But can you change the fact the milk is spilt? No, of course not. Right, so once you accept the fact the milk is spilt, like it or not, you can then free up the energy of resistance to allow you to channel it into making a better decision, for example, on how to clean up the milk, or how to explain to your mum that the new carpet's ruined, or whatever it may be. So with the prisoners, one of the first things I was able to try to do to make a difference was to get them to accept their present circumstances you know, rather than resist them. And, you know, and that is a, a major shift for a lot of people in terms of awareness because you know, they're resisting everything. They're resisting the system, they're resisting the circumstances, and they're playing the what if, if only game. Or if my lawyers had said this instead of that, or if only I hadn't done this and left fingerprint, or whatever it may be. You, know, you can't change anything that has happened and to think so is, is mental futility and will keep you in that hamster wheel of depression because there's no way out of it. How do you go and change the past? You can't. So the first moment you accept it, you free up the level of energy that you've been using to resist and you allow that to channel into something positive. And that positive could be, yeah, how to file an appeal, how to, you know, learn from it, how to ask better questions. Now, one thing is that questions are the steering wheel of the mind. And most people that are depressed are depressed because they keep getting answers to bad questions. Why does my life suck? Why me? Why am I a victim? Why did this happen to me? Why not that? All of this stuff, and the brain will find an answer. It's its job. Oh, well, clearly you're not good enough. Yeah, oh, you know, clearly what your, you know, your parents said about you not being you know, lovable is true. Yeah, clearly that, you know, all of that stuff. The brain is like a faithful Labrador. You have a question, it's like throwing a stick. It will go find it. Yeah, the answer to that question, because that's what it does. So one of the best things to start shifting focus is to ask better questions. Yeah, one of the first questions I asked about it was, what's funny about this I've not noticed yet? Now that may take a while to answer for some people, but you're getting on the right track. Or, you know, what is it about this that I can learn from? See, the difference between, you know, what have I lost versus what have I learned can be the difference between a life of antidepressants versus a life of possibility. Yeah, and being able to come through that experience. And when we can bring it full circle to about how do we take the focus off ourselves, many of the prisoners found that they had purpose about being able to use this experience in order to help others. And if you go to any kind of program in you know, prison that has been successful, it usually has some form of ministry involved and that level of ministry, or go to Alcoholics Anonymous yeah, and the 12-step program, or all of that program is based upon first, accepting where you're at. Second, believing in something smarter or you know, a bigger game or something higher than you, more important than you, and allowing you to surrender to the wisdom of the current of life, yeah, to that intelligence, and then find something within you that you can then contribute as a lesson, even as a warning. Yeah, if you've screwed up, then you're able to contribute something of value to somebody by showing them what not to do. Yeah, and I had that conversation with many prisoners. Mm -hmm. Yeah, by saying, hey, listen, yeah, oh, I'm, I'm upset, I'm depressed, I've got kids, yeah, I'm in jail. Yeah, well, for a start, you know, one of the guys who was suicidal, uh, he was like, you know, I'm gonna kill myself because I've got you know, a daughter I've not seen for 12 months who's a year old. My wife's about to have another baby. I'm gonna miss the birth and the first year of her life. But at least if I kill myself now, uh, they'll never know me. Now that's a pretty compelling reason for a person who is invalidating his identity as a father and now feels a failure. That's a compelling reason to check out because he's linking redemption to the act of suicide. And my question was, what do you think your girls will hear? Oh, that I was sorry. I'm like, no, 
That's what you want them to hear. What they'll actually hear is that my dad didn't care enough about me to bother to stick around. Yeah, and it says, and look at this, if you ever had the chance to choose when you were going to prison, assuming you had to choose, yeah, I'd choose a time that kids couldn't remember. Yeah, perfect. And if you kill yourself now and they grow up with the awareness of feeling so much insignificance and lack of self-worth because their dad didn't love them enough clearly to stick around, they'll probably grow up with enough insecurities to be able to validate that by attracting somebody that'll prove it by treating them like shit. Or they'll realize that no amount of heroin can cover the amount of you know, gap in their soul and they'll probably end up in prison themselves or want to commit suicide themselves. And after all, why not? Because that's what dad did. So by killing himself, he probably dishonors his daughters in the most brutally you know, painful way by setting themselves up for a lifetime of hurt. Now, when that awareness sinks in, you open the door to a new awareness. I said, so what would happen if instead your daughters grew up with a different lesson? And that is that no matter what happens in life, yeah, and let's face it, we all make mistakes. Yeah, if dad went away, but he came out of that stronger, wiser, and proved that no matter what life hits you with what kind of bat, you can come out of it as a better person with more wisdom, more understanding, more compassion, more tolerance, more, more knowledge, and, and a stronger person. Now, if your girls got that lesson growing up, what kind of life do you think they'd have? I mean, in that moment, you completely recontextualize the experience of what he thought he was doing and link it to massive pain and the opposite to massive pleasure. And I'm like, so you think you can handle a little bit of prison time to be able to prove them that lesson? And he's like, damn right I can. And now he's got a purpose. He's in prison to be able to give his daughters one of the best lessons they could have growing up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just being able to see it from that angle. Yeah, because now it's no longer about him and what he's upset about and he's missing his daughters. No, now he's in the gym building the strength to be able to give them a lesson on how to survive that they wouldn't be able to have had he not done that. You brought up a very important point because life throws you a lot of curveballs. Life throws you a lot of unexpected things that hit you and you're like, holy cow, how the hell uh, did this happen here? And your reaction is the most important thing you have. I always keep saying on this YouTube channel, your reaction matters more than you think, more than you know, more than you can even comprehend, especially your subconscious. And a lot of these things from what I got from, you from what you're saying is that they're cycles, cycles of fear, cycles of hate. Uh, and you look at uh, fatherless homes, they continue to be fatherless homes when the kids grow up. Uh, when you see parents that divorced, their kids are more likely to be divorced uh, because of just the way that they were growing up. And it's about ending that cycle, which is not easy at all. Uh, do you have, um, you know, before we get into just your website and the new book you have coming out, do you have just a couple quick tips? Mine's always gratitude, mine's always staying positive uh, to, you know, help people get out of that horrible negative cycle loop that so many people are caught up on. And I personally believe society kind of, uh, and, and the social controllers kind of push on us to have us in this low state. A lot of the experiences people have uh, come from a lack of understanding as to what adversity is. Yeah, and I'll give you an analogy. I, I call it the fact that we're in earth school. Yeah, because if you were to take one you know, awareness out of this interview and really own it, I would invite you to take the awareness that life is a growth centric experience. You know, the strongest trees don't grow in the best soil. They grow in the strongest winds. And if you want to become the best version of yourself, then start praying for some strong winds. And many people have had them, but don't recognize it. You know, they, they start bitching about it because they don't understand the context. You know, if you're in the gym and you know, you're there because you're training for a marathon or you're training for a competition and you've hired a really good personal trainer, and you're then doing curls and you know, the personal trainer's screaming out, come on, you can do one more and you're really trying and you're busting it out and your arms and biceps are screaming. Now, from the perspective of the muscle fiber, you're looking up at the brain saying, whoa, dude, what the hell are you doing? Stop, please send pain signals. Tell, I'm being broken down. This is too painful. Stop. From the perspective of the athlete, then what happens? You're saying, no, I can do one more. Come on, I've got this. And you feel proud the fact you can't lift your arms for two days. Yeah, now, life is our personal trainer. It will put weight on the bar because life is a growth centric experience. Now, if you're not aware of that, you're going to be complaining at the, you know, why am I in this gym? Why am I being told to lift weights? No, you're here to grow. That's part of what the game is. Yeah, grow mentally yeah, and emotionally. And most people grow physically, we're aware of that, but they never grow mentally or emotionally because they don't realize that's a choice. We don't get to choose whether we grow chronologically. So if you can understand when adversity comes, you can take one or two of those perspectives. You can be the muscle fiber complaining at the weight, 
or you can be the athlete understanding that this is what's building the strength that you can then bring more of you to the world to give the gift of who you are. And that's a choice. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I wrote a, an article within two weeks of being in there that I, I sneakily wrote when I had found myself with brief access to a computer in education, and I, I banged out 50 copies. It got me put in solitary. But, you know, I banged out 50 copies. It was called Mud or Stars. And it was taken after the old adage. You know, two men sat behind prison bars. One saw mud, the other saw stars. And that the condition was identical for both, but how one chose to perceive it, their reaction to it, governed their entire experience. Mm -hmm. You know, and so this article, you know, it got people off drugs for depression, and it was basically explaining. It was, it was, a, it was a fictional story. And it really followed a, a person going to prison for the first time and like being caught deer in the headlights and he's in the processing room with like dozens of other prisoners. And he happens to sit next to this wise old mentor type figure and they have this conversation. And the conversation is where I could really put a lot of the tips and techniques and stuff that this old guy is saying and the guy's challenging him and he's calling him on it. And, and, and you follow this conversation, it reveals certain levels of awarenesses that allow you to come to terms with the understanding that, you know, A, nobody can do anything to you emotionally without your permission. Case closed. Mm -hmm. That life is a growth-centric experience. Yeah, if you go to school and you don't understand the context for school, you're going to complain at the lessons. You're, Why am I sitting here? Why am I being given a test? If you understand the context for school, and yeah, you still may not like the exams, but you know why you're there. And if you don't have that context for earth school, you're going to think that life's about designing myself into a comfort zone. And guess what? Life is going to bring you the exams, the graduation events, and if you fail them, you're going to have to repeat them. Now, if you pass the test, yeah, you pass sixth grade, you go to seventh grade, and guess what? The exams are harder. They're meant to be. It's part of the game. Again, we're here as a you know, pr processional growth experience so that we can give more of who we are to the world. And here's what I'll leave you with. Unfortunately, when we're at low levels of consciousness, when we're in victim mode, when we're blaming everybody, when life sucks and, you know, and we want to prove it, and we hide behind our story to deny ourselves access to courage to be able to step forward out of it, then we tend to learn more from pain than pleasure. So life will continue to slap you to get your attention. The second you start to recognize that life's not about me, it's about how can I serve as an example, not a warning. How can I give my gift? How can I inspire people? How can I put a smile on somebody else's face rather than my own? Because that's what makes us feel better. Then you start raising your consciousness and you can start learning more from pleasurable lessons than painful ones. And life tends to work a lot more the second we give up victimhood. Mm -hmm. And from there, yeah, we're on a whole different journey. Just like I said in the beginning, you either see crap or you see fertilizer and it all begins with that mindset of how you see things, how you perceive things and where you go forward in life. So thank you for that reminder. I made a lot of mistakes. I'm relearning a lot of lessons even now that I thought I had handled and taken care of. And it's like, oh, no, no, you don't. Life comes at you, slaps you upside the head. It's like, okay, well, I got to humble myself and I got to learn these things. And I appreciate you helping me learn some of these things and reminding me some of the lessons that we all sometimes forget. Where can people find out more information about you? and you also have a book coming out too. Yes, well, my website is petersage.com and um, yes, I, I'm, I'm very excited about the book. It's actually the 11 letters that I wrote from prison to my high-level coaching clients and, and my coaching groups where I was trying to share with them all of the different things that I was teaching, the, you know, the techniques I was using, and it's, it's really a how-to manual on how to handle any adversity in your life. You know, I, I, it was never really intended to be published, but when I came out and people said, look, please put this out as a book because it can help so many people. You know, there's so much in there. It's the best work that I, I could come up with. And I'll be honest, you know, I, I didn't see it coming. You know, I lost my business, I lost my home, I lost you know, all of this money in legal costs. You know, I basically had the reset button pressed at uh, the top of my game. And it was the most incredible, magical, and, and inspiring adventure I've ever had, and I'd never swap a second. So, you know, if you read the, it's called The Inside Track, and if you say go to petersage.com, you can download the first chapter, and uh, it should be on Amazon within the next uh, week. Uh, we're doing a, a whole event to be able to launch that, and I'm very happy and very proud of it, to be able to help some people with it. Okay, so we're going to continue this conversation and actually get into more hippy dippy topics. And if you want to see that, check it out on our website and Patreon page, which the links will be in the description below. Thank you guys for being the amazing human beings that you are, incentivizing this content, allowing me to do this. And that's why I love you guys. Stay tuned for a lot more.